This is Leave Your Mark. I'm Vince Cortez, and today's guest is Ben Cott, a meditation teacher, spiritual coach, and author dedicated to guiding individuals towards spiritual awakening and personal growth. With experience in adapting ancient wisdom for modern life, Ben empowers people to live their fullest potential. He also serves as a hospice chaplain and a prison meditation teacher, bringing his compassionate presence to those in critical transitions. Ben, thank you for being my guest today. Vince, I'm honored. Thanks for having Hi me. There. And welcome. Now it's time for America's, America's favorite, podcast. favorite podcast. Leave your mark with your host, Vince Cortez. If it's fly, loose fit it. It's Cortez. If freeze and chubbies in it. It's Cortez. Leave your mark. It's about inspiring the world. One guess at a time. Pass the word from Brooklyn to Pittsburgh, from urban to suburb. It's Cortez. You heard? And here is our host, Vince Cortez. You have an interesting road. I, I want to touch on the hospice and the prison because there's a lot of meat and potatoes there. You mentioned that you've taken your experience to arrive at this point. First, I'd like to review with my audience who you are, where you're from, and how you arrived here. You're born and raised in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Your father, Bill, was an attorney. Your mother, Gloria, was a homemaker, social worker, adoption agent. You have three siblings, Bill, Dan, and Tim, and you share a lot of sports and had enjoyment in your childhood. Could you share what you did with your brothers? Well, we're huge Green Bay Packer fans. Grew up in Wisconsin, where I live now. We had this big backyard, and um, when we were, like, a little bit before middle school and in the middle school ages, we started our own neighborhood football league, the Brady Football League, because we lived on Brady Road. And uh, so we got other neighbor kids involved, and it really was like two-on-two, two-hand touch football. So we were all on a couple teams, and we always had to figure things out if we were playing the other team that we were on because we needed a substitute. And then biking around the neighborhood, like Stranger Things without the Stranger Things. Now, you mentioned the church community was a big part of your life growing up. What were you doing where you're mixing life with the community at church? So... Church was every Sunday. It wasn't just the worship service we attended. It was a, a community we were part of. My brothers and I went to a small Christian school affiliated with the church. Throughout the, the week, we would be seeing a lot of people that we would also see then on Sundays. And what I would say about it, there's all sorts of memories, but you know, I can remember after church being in the, the lobby where the adults are drinking coffee and us kids are trying to get cookies and lemonade or something. But really felt like it was a very supportive, nurturing environment, grateful. As it would play out later, in high school, Brookfield East, Spartans, you played football track, musicals, and the student council. So you were very active in all categories, social, athletic, and in the church. So a very full youth. Now, you end up going to Calvin University, and you get a degree in Spanish, and then you get your master's in divinity, at Calvin Theological Seminary. So this is deep-rooted in you, and you're off to college. And what happens the first month of college? Yeah, so I moved from Wisconsin to Grand Rapids, Michigan, and I saw this beautiful girl the first month of college. In fact, I remember she was wearing like this old faded Coca-Cola T-shirt, and I didn't know it then, but soon I knew it. I sensed it. That's Cherie. She became my wife about four years later after we graduated college. She's my best friend. We've been on all sorts of adventures together, most notably the three children that we have, Evie, Jackson, and Zara. We've been married 21 years. Now, in 2008, you start Awake Church in Seattle? When I was a junior in college, I was a Spanish major. I did a semester abroad in Spain, which was one of the greatest decisions I made. Met my best friend there, Nico, in my book, The Way Home. He's a dear friend to this day. But we had an experience in Sevilla, Seville. We were sitting on a park bench, each on different benches. And we were about a month into the trip, and we each had our own mystical experiences. I felt like the divine was speaking to me and sensed this calling into what it was for me is a calling into ministry, into serving and helping others. And so that's what led to me going into divinity school, into seminary, out of college. That began a journey of asking this question of, really, how do I uh, follow Jesus? 
That's how I describe it at that point. How do I build community? How do I seek justice? And that led to starting this church in Seattle in 2008 called Awake, where we were serving all sorts of people who were marginalized in the community, dealing with homelessness, mental illness, substance addiction, women caught up in prostitution. And a lot of that, by the way, was just way beyond my experience, beyond my expertise, but I absolutely felt called to it, along with a community of, of amazing humans. We were able to serve others for about a decade, and the work is still going on, but in terms of my role. But again, we really viewed that as this mutual experience where we were being blessed and supported and learning things from those who were on the margin of our community. Ever feel like a bad day is dragging you down? Bad days are really good days in disguise. It shows you those tough moments are actually stepping stones to growth. Transform your mindset and discover the hidden gifts in every challenge available now. Now, is that when you were forging your family as well? Exactly. Those Started are some a church. Deep steps there, young man. Yes. Come so, 2008 that. church and 2008, my first daughter was born. It was crazy. You are on fast forward right there. The idea of taking on a ministry and the level of despair you were experiencing right out of the gate, this is forging who you're going to be and what you're going to manage later on. An incredible amount of courage to take that on with little to no experience other than being a part of that community when you were younger that gave you a better feel for how to handle the situation you would now be in. So I'm sure 10 years went by really quick. It really did. Our kids were born within three and a half years of each other. So that was pretty intense. My wife was in graduate school. She's a therapist. That was all going on. And we started not only the church, but we started a community center called the Aurora Commons, still in North Seattle, serving hundreds of people. I, I talk about this in my book, but after, after about eight years, I, I had a burnout moment, which set the stage for the next chapter. I got to a point where even doing meaningful work and helping people, I lost contact with myself. I was trying to achieve and get these things going. I had this obsession with perfection and also doing things to get the approval of others. Over time, that caught up with me. And um, one day on a rainy morning run, I was on my way home, charged up this hill. Usually I'd sprint the last 10 blocks, but one day I stopped and this voice said, if you don't have your heart, you have nothing. That really began a journey into shedding some of my patterns that were unhelpful. We all have operating patterns that no longer serve us, but I had to do that work of shedding that so that something new could be born. I love it. That intuitive voice was speaking loud and clear, stop you from your sprint. Now, does this what inspired you to write your book, The Way Home, Discovering the Hero's Journey to Wholeness at Midlife? Yeah, I went on a five-year journey, mostly an interior journey. I think each of us is invited into midlife isn't just an age range, say 35 to 55. Midlife is this hinge point or transition between who you've been and who you're becoming. And so I had to go on this kind of soul quest, this inner adventure to unpack a lot of maybe some negative patterns and see so much of my life, just look back and see it with gratitude, but figure out what I need to leave behind and what I carry forward to make my most generative contribution this moment or the community I'm in. This is interesting because you talk to a cactus share what happens because the quote that caught my ear was this, as this conversation or this moment it transpires you had this urge to take your clothes off and hug a cactus i appreciate you asking first of all no substances were involved that was a mystical experience mystical could sound like something crazier out there studies show that 80 percent of people say that they've had experiences where they feel like they're in tune with something more or God speaks to them or something they can't explain. The, the thing is in our society, very scientific, very materialistic, we don't often talk about those things. We treat it like there's a tab taboo around it. But our brains are literally wired for this kind of spiritual experience. You can check out the book Awakened Brain by Lisa Miller if you want to learn more about that. So with that as a little context, I was in this dark night of the soul season of my life trying to figure out who I am. A big part was conversing or, or being in nature, going on wanders. Had 
a few trips to the desert during that time. I felt there's a playfulness that when opening yourself to mystical experiences, maybe God, the divine, or something more, however you want to phrase that, speaking to you. I was all in, desperate for a way forward. And this one particular time I was in Arizona, and I felt like this butterfly led me over to this cactus. I was carrying a lot of grief and sadness, and I gave myself over to this experience and felt like the cactus was saying to me, yes, take your clothes off, which, by the way, sounds crazy, but there is precedent for this. If, if anyone's familiar with the story of Moses in the Bible, I was he, just takes off, say right? he takes off his sandals as he's in front of this burning bush because the ground he's standing on is holy. It felt like I was in this holy, sacred space leading up to that moment of actually hugging the cactus naked. It had given me the impression, I have a story to tell you. And I was like, what, what are you going to tell me? In what followed, I noticed a bullet casing on the ground. And another was cactus had bullet holes and it had been stabbed by a wooden stake. It was like this cactus was wanting to share with me its pain and its wounds and the violence it experienced. I was overwhelmed by it because it felt like it really told me its story. It showed me about itself. And that enabled me to feel connected not only to the grief of that cactus, to the grief and pain of our planet, my own grief. So... There's more I could say about it. Obviously, it is in the book. If people want to read more, it might sound out there, but it was a, a formative moment. We might have these sacred moments that are also ridiculous. Why not pay attention? They have something to teach us. Mm -hmm. I, I shared one of those moments myself. I could only characterize it as a miracle because I was conscious, not on any medication, and I wasn't sleeping. It's amazing how the spirit will touch us and get us to move. Yes, so yes. this leads me to the point where you decide to be a chaplain in a hospice. I was in a hospice myself for three weeks. It's a pretty dark place. What attracted you to a hospice and what are you experiencing in your initial work there? About two years ago, as I finished the book and was working on it with the publisher, I, I felt this desire to volunteer as a hospice companion, which if you're listening to this and you feel moved, hospice agencies are looking for volunteers to do all sorts of things, play music or do art. Or, there's so many opportunities to just be a companion to people. I initially started as a volunteer. I have this pastoral background in a way. I'm always like a, a chaplain alongside people in difficult situations. But this season in my life, Having gone on this soul journey, while physically I didn't die, I underwent metaphorical deaths. I got really familiar with this idea of my own mortality and the mortality of every single human being. And getting close to death in that sense prepared me and gave me comfort in being in one of the most vulnerable states as a human, which is approaching death. I signed up to volunteer and had a meaningful year after a bit, I suddenly had more space in my life. I was looking at other jobs and roles, but then I'd have to give up hospice volunteering. And that spoke to me. I don't have to give it up. What if the job I'm moving into is hospice chaplaincy? A role opened up part-time, and I jumped into it. And now every week I see a dozen or so patients. The most difficult experience I had was the first person that I met when I was a volunteer. The first person that I was a companion for, because it was a young woman, 37, in a memory care facility. Some of the people in there are on hospice care, not all of them. She had a form of dementia. She could not communicate anymore. Her movement was very halting. We would walk around the hallway. I would help feed her sometimes. The most tragic thing was, like, you go in her room, and there she would crawl on this bed beneath the photos of her two toddlers, like young children. Mm. It was a young mother, and totally already separate from that life, not remembering it, not at least to the degree that we understand that. There's something about that. It was both super troubling and gave me to understand so many people who are in difficult situations and not just them, but the family around them. And they're largely hidden and invisible to our society. And I feel fortunate to be a loving presence. That's my mm -hmm. role to be a loving presence. And when appropriate, share the anonymous details of what these people are undergoing. Imagine a moment of true happiness, the warmth, the lightness, the ease. Now, what if you could feel that way every single day? Invincible Coaching is designed to help you unlock that level of joy and fulfillment, guiding you toward a life that feels aligned and deeply satisfying. Ready to make it your new reality? Click the link below. A 
the hospice is a rather particular or interesting place in that there's so many different stories in there and there's a lot of similarities in the stories as they all have the same fate how they arrive at that fate is really touching and and moving as far as going and having the experience that you are now you also said that you go in into prisons and your meditation teacher inside the prisons. First, what drew you to, to this line of work? How long have you been doing this? I've been teaching meditation since before I moved back here to Wisconsin. So since late 2019. And I'll work with professionals of all kinds, lawyers, doctors, nonprofit leaders, financial advisors, entrepreneurs, all sorts. And a big part of it is giving people a effortless, easy, enjoyable tool to release stress. And as a meditation teacher, that's the tip of the iceberg. We could talk about releasing stress and anxiety. There's this whole other inner life or spiritual dimension that I love exploring if that's what people want to do. But I got initially into that work because, well, as I told you in that early morning run all those years ago, the initial discovery before kind of those deeper issues was that I was burned out. I wasn't moving through the world in a sustainable way, going too fast, trying to do too much, trying to be everything to everyone. And that led to this overload of stress, which eventually I needed a major reset. So that's why I got into not only the practice of meditation for myself, but then this desire to share it with others. Fast forward a few years after I started teaching, I got connected with a local organization in Wisconsin that does restorative justice work, it brings victims, offenders, judicial officials, law enforcement, and community members for a process of healing. Now, these offenders are in, in prison for something. They're incarcerated. But it's facilitating these healing experiences that even though judicially, justice-wise, there's a, a consequence, there's this other more reparative, restorative work. I was so inspired by the work, hey, how can I help? And before you know it, I got introduced to someone who led programming at a prison here in Wisconsin. And that led to me teaching a meditation course. So I, I taught that multiple times. And now I have two prisons I'm at every Monday doing a weekly class. I had a call with a youth facility and I have a women's facility I'll be working with in November. All that together is what I call the withinproject.org. It's a nonprofit effort. I'm raising funds for anyone who's interested in supporting this kind of thing. But bringing this healing tool that really not only helps people release stress, but also heal deep trauma, which those in, incarcerated have experienced not only in each day and being in that setting, but often the things that led them to commit the, the crimes that they committed, it's a whole lot of trauma. I can't always explain how I feel called to it. It's almost like the doors open. There is this through line in my story. When I look back to the church and the hurting people, we came alongside. Yeah, that carries forward to today. The thread played through. And the community part with your youth. It, it, and that being an integral part in your younger days, it, it's probably a big comfort zone for you. Yours is a fascinating story, Ben. You've got a lot of experience in such a short time. How would you like to leave your mark? Oh, that's a beautiful question. I think my main thing, again, when I look at this through line, my work really has been at the intersection of like spirituality, inner life, community or belonging, and social healing. Um, I, I think the mark that I love to leave is this reminder to everyone I'm with, hopefully, and to those I interact with that that every human being is loved and worthy of belonging, no matter what we've done. Now, that, that doesn't mean that there's like quick fixes and we don't have boundaries and there isn't justice. Like love isn't just something soft, like it does have its edges and there's a strength to it. But for me to go into the settings where someone's dying or people are in prison for something, it's, I like to feel like even through my presence, not even through words, it's like just this reminder that you are loved. And then to go from those settings into other spaces through my writing or speaking to share those stories because often, Vince, it's not that I'm teaching these things. They are saying things about love, belonging, dignity, grace, how we carry ourselves and wise sayings. And I want to share those with others who need to hear them as a reminder that each person is loved. Hey, Ben, where can we get more information? You could go to benjamincott.com. The link also thewayhomebook.com will also get you to that website. But you can find out about my book or my Substack newsletter. I'm on TikTok sharing stories. Lots of different spaces. I'm trying to get them more, I guess, like in the same place or at least a common landing spot. But there's lots of different spaces. Give that a try. I really appreciate you having me here. 
the the juggernaut of online marketing. You're going. You know it. Right there. There's too many different avenues to get in touch with somebody. It's not just the old pick up the phone and give them. No, this has been a pleasure having you. I will definitely keep tabs and watch your journey. You're doing incredible work in your community, family, education. You're a polished stem, and we appreciate you being here. We need more of your work out there. Thank you for being my guest today. Vince, thanks so much for having me. Really appreciate your curiosity and presence. That was a great episode with Ben Cott. If you enjoyed that, you have to listen to this next one.